Hello, everyone. Welcome to Orthodox Shahada again. I'm Lewis, and uh, today I'm here with uh, Father Deacon Dr. Ananias. Um, for some of you, you may know him already. He's done a lot of stuff with uh, Jay Dyer. Uh, but could you please introduce yourself for us in terms of your academic background and what your interests are? Thank you, Lewis. Wonderful to be here. Wonderful to see all of you. I'm excited about this. Uh, yeah, just a little bit about my academic background. Uh, I went to, prior to going to a four-year college, I was studying physics um, and mathematics because I wanted to actually go into physics. And then instead of transferring uh, by God's providence, I actually found a classical liberal arts college, which was really nice because at the same time I was taking classes at a community college, a junior college in philosophy. So I kind of wanted to do all of that stuff. But uh, Lewis, as you know, um, schools are very specialized. It's like you can only pick one. So the fact that I found a uh, classical order, liberal arts, quadrivium, trivium, uh, based on the great books program was amazing that I was able to do all of that. And so uh, my background of studying mathematics and science um, played in very well. And I got a bachelor's in liberal arts, classical liberal arts from Thomas Aquinas College, the great book school that was equivalent to uh, a double major in philosophy, theology, double minor in mathematics and physics, uh, science, and then uh, from there, I went to grad school, um, did a master's program at University College Dublin in Ireland. And my emphasis was on epistemology, comparing the epistemology of Aristotle and Immanuel Kant. So the kind of antiquity and kind of modern theories and about sense perception versus kind of transcendental categories, Kantian categories of our perception. And then I went into the PhD program at University College Dublin in Ireland, and I did a PhD uh, emphasizing, let's see, philosophy of mind and philosophy of science. So coming up with a, an alternative theory of nature as an attempt to solve the mind-body problem. So that involved a lot of, it pulled from a lot of the stuff from the epistemology aspect, also was incorporating philosophy of science and philosophy of mind. And then also I have a DVP from St. Vladimir's Seminary, and then I was ordained a deacon October, uh, two, let's see, 2016. And so that's kind of my educational background I teach online at uh, Fullerton College in California, and I am a professor of philosophy here in Montana at Carroll College. I've taught at Azusa Pacific, I've taught at University College Dublin, and Cal State Fullerton as well. So that's kind of my background and credentials. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So uh, today we're actually going to talk about one of your papers called An Orthodox Theory of Knowledge, which is uh, where I titled the screen the way it is, uh, the epistemological and apologetic method of the church fathers. And I will put it in the description after the stream. Um, some of the questions I might ask will be a bit off kind of the script or whatever. So my, my, my question, which isn't on the questions, first of all, is just what led you to wrote this paper in the first place? And what's the what's the basic kind of idea you were trying to get across? So I'd say just kind of rewind. I was introduced to philosophy uh, somewhere around 1995, 96, about 95, uh, when I was a senior in high school, junior, senior high school. And I started attending a group that uh, Perry Robinson was a member of called Dialogue. Uh, you might have heard of Russ Mannion and Father Paul and a lot of these people that this is where I actually 
started learning philosophy. And they weren't Calvinists, but they had been working on transcendental arguments for the existence of God for, for some time. And I've actively been a part of that group since then. And so my training in apologetics was to was very being very familiar with kind of presuppositional and transcendental arguments. Now I kind of went wayward for a while when obviously I went to Thomas Aquinas College and embraced kind of Thomistic Aristotelian um, natural theology and classical arguments for the existence of God. However, I'd say something really kind of interesting happened, not only me converting to orthodoxy that changed that, but it was all these kind of disparate things in my life and things that I studied kind of all coalesced. I would say that my experience dealing with philosophy of science and how science works started to influence me together with reading the fathers and their kind of apologetic methods that allowed me to kind of break from that prior heterodox uh, philosophical and ideological baggage of comatomism in. And we all bring that stuff in. Forgive me. I'm sorry. Um, when I converted, I still had a lot of these kind of Aristotelian Thomistic ideas uh, kind of classical arguments and natural theology from a Western perspective. And, but God in his grace was able to kind of use those different things. And so I returned back and saw that, well, look, not in, again, the reform way, because people are always going to think, well, transcendental presuppositional arguments, that's reformed faith. It's not. Um, reformed faith, whatever they get right about the kind of presuppositional apologetics and transcendental arguments, they get that from the fathers. And I began to realize that that kind of methodology and the way that they approach it was fundamentally different than epistemological uh, projects going on in Western Christianity. And this kind of motivated me to, in light of modern kind of epistemic challenges um, in philosophy directed at you know, orthodoxy, a lot of the stuff comes from atheists, atheist objections and things like that. I realized not only the power of kind of presuppositional apologetics and transcendental arguments, I saw that that methodology was in the church fathers and orthodoxy. And that was what motivated me to really start digging in and kind of formalizing a lot of this stuff. Uh, for kind of modern philosophers, right? You got to speak their language. And it's like, well, okay, the principles are in the fathers. Now let me translate it in a kind of language that you can understand. And that was kind of an, uh, one of the impetuses behind uh, the paper. And also to clarify, a lot of people, aren't we just, you know, the same as... Uh, what the Roman Catholics have been doing and as far as their apologetics and arguments. And I wanted to make that clear that I think there's fundamentally different projects uh, from going back in history, starting from certain um, issues and starting points, things that they accepted that we Orthodox actually do not. Mm, excellent. Um, and throughout the war, well, the first sort of, maybe uh, half of the paper is a critique of different theories of truth and also a natural theology. And yes. at the beginning, you make a distinction between what you call, uh, between what's called autonomous epistemology and what you call a theonomous epistemology. Could you talk to us a little bit about what those two things are and why you think it was important to contrast them? Yes. Um... I'm indebted to Rasmanian for this kind of distinction between autonomous and theonomous uh, epistemology. And again, it's about, I saw uh, what was going on through the history of, of thought is people building and attempting to give an account for knowledge in different ways. And so the question 
that I realize isn't whether a person can have knowledge, but rather can someone from their own self-constructed epistemic starting points or their own presuppositions, that's what I mean by autonomous, is opposed to the kind of revelatory, right, basing it in um, the revelation of God. Can somebody from their own epistemic starting points, their own presuppositions, and everybody has presuppositions. If you look through the history of thought, there's nobody that's presuppositionally neutral. People have a metaphysics, they have an ontology, and they're going to use those to say, yes, these can, from these starting points, I can actually give an account for how knowledge is both possible and I can give a coherent account of that. Well, I wanted to know that. I want to know, can you actually do that without ultimately referring back to this being grounded and God is the only necessary condition for the possibility of knowledge? Could you provide a coherent account of knowledge that isn't either viciously circular, arbitrary, incoherent, or contradictory, self-defeating? So this is what I mean by autonomous epistemology. An epistemological account of how knowledge would be possible without it being grounded in the living God who is the necessary conditions for the possibility of knowledge. Obviously, there are different senses of, of epistemologies that can, different sense of a, epistemology being autonomous as opposed to theonomous. There, the clear cases would be something like uh, secular epistemology where you know either in an agnostic or atheistic sense that you attempt to construct a theory of knowledge without god and without acknowledging god's revelation to mankind but i also want to qualify that even theists can be committed to autonomous epistemology how so if they believe that it's possible from non-revelatory principles a person can provide a coherent account of how knowledge is possible. Even if that theist would reason to God later on as the cause of such conditions, but only from such autonomous epistemic starting points. So we only have to think about Aquinas, for example, who accepts that it's possible, if you asked Aquinas, is it possible from your kind of Aristotelian metaphysics and starting point could an atheist from that kind of uh, peripatetic axioms and, and things like that and kind of a posteriori uh, epistemology, could they give a coherent account of how knowledge is possible before they get to eventually conclude to the existence of God? Because obviously Aquinas is going to think that, like, well, if you keep reasoning out properly, then you get to God, which, you know, ultimately it grounds the whole thing. But that's not what I'm actually curious about and concerned. I want to know from those starting points, if they're divorced from, right, or if that's later on that God grounds it, could an atheist or believe or given a, from those points, give a coherent account for how knowledge is possible. And what I'm gonna argue obviously in the paper is no. So there are worse theists, right, than Aquinas. Uh, we could think about Descartes who's far worse. Descartes constructs an entire epistemology based on the assumption that even if God didn't exist, it would be possible to provide an account for how knowledge is possible. Now, that's something that even Aquinas wouldn't dare to say. Uh, if you asked Aquinas that, like, if God didn't exist, would knowledge be possible or could you give a coherent account of it? No. Uh, so the audacity of Descartes, like, and that's why sometimes it's argued that Descartes really is the father of modernity. Mm. Obviously, I think that both are examples of autonomous epistemologies because both would acknowledge that, yes, from those starting points alone, without grounding those in God, you could, as an atheist, give a coherent account of how knowledge is possible. Uh, 
Theonomous epistemology, though, it is just to deny that. Theonomous is no. You couldn't isolate it. You couldn't isolate those principles or starting points from ultimate reference to God's revelation to mankind is grounding and providing the necessary conditions for the possibility of knowledge. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, I think it might be helpful also if you could perhaps define what you mean by knowledge. Um, yeah, so, I mean, there's a whole host of like different problems that come up and we can say, look, we don't have a perfect definition of knowledge. Um, you only have to think about the Gettier problem. But let's just say as far as kind of run of the mill, and I'm willing to add different conditions on that or adapt it or something like that. But for the most part, the traditional kind of conception of knowledge would be, well, obviously you have to have a belief and it's true. Um, and you have kind of sufficient reasons for holding that it's true. So you believe that it's true. It's a true belief, i.e., how do we define a belief? The belief the tree is green is true if and only if the tree is actually green. Um, you believe that to be true. It's not, your belief isn't accidental. Um, but I mean, the truth of your belief isn't accidental. And again, you have good reasons to, you have justification. Now, obviously, the get here problem brings in things that say, well, look, that's not going to be good enough for knowledge. But all the get here problem shows is there's probably a fourth condition that needs to be added. But I think for the most part, we don't have to, like an archer, hit the bullseye to get a perfect definition to actually do epistemology and talk about knowledge, right? We can still hit the target even though we're not. And I think that's kind of what we're doing when we have, look, let's just start with kind of a run of the mill working definition of knowledge is a true justified belief. So that opens up the door for, well, what is justification? What are kind of sufficient standards for um, holding a, a belief? What's sufficient evidence? And so that opens up and rolls back into the whole concept of what is justification and how would one be justified and how would one actually know or have criteria for justification criteria yeah we'll we'll talk about that um a little bit later um so with respect to natural theology and autonomous epistemology um you kind of say that there's a right sense and a wrong sense to natural theology I think when we hear that someone denies natural theology or when I say we, I mean people in general who are Christians, they might think that what you're saying is that you can't conclude that God exists from evidence in the creation. Right. Right. Which is, I, I noticed that, mm -hmm. which is, which is a, a, yes, go ahead. You can explain. Well, even with, um, you know, David Bradshaw's recent book, and then when that was kind of being published, and, you know, Swinburne have, having these kind of articles out, Richard Swinburne, it seemed to me that this was kind of this false dichotomy that people had in their mind. Natural theology means we can use our reason and look at nature and know that there's a God. Well, what's the alternative? Fideism. So that, that always seems to be presented to me that like, well, that must, if you deny natural theology, you must be a fideist that uh, you can't. Just for the audience. Fideist would be somebody that your encounter with God or accepting God wouldn't be through kind of dionia or um, the use of reason. The, the use of reason in your, your faculties of inference, uh, discursive reasoning, your rational faculties are excluded. That's not how you get to God. You have to accept God by the antithesis of that, 
belief without that pure blind kind of faith. And I don't know exactly where that originated, that kind of false dichotomy. But yeah, you're you're absolutely right. That's we accept that. And and that's part of the problem too. Haven't Lewis, we've encountered this so many times. We all use these words and then just pretend that everybody has the same <laughs> understanding by those words. Yeah. And so we've got to be able to flesh out that look for this group or these types of philosophers, this term means something completely indifferent. And that's what I've had to kind of think through with natural theology. We do believe in natural theology, but perhaps we mean something different than what other people mean by it. And again, that's going to be conditioned by a set of beliefs and uh, you know antecedent beliefs and practices. And we need to kind of roll that back in our analysis and look because that's going to shape how we do natural theology and what we actually think natural theology is. So yes, I actually believe is an orthodox there is a right sense of natural theology and we do it. And there's an incorrect sense. Mm -hmm. Now, think about this. I mean, even in light of, uh, I was thinking about this with Dr. Uh, David Bradshaw's book that was published through uh, IOTA. You know, some of the uh, readings through some of the authors, an argument. Argument is giving reasons to believe something. A good argument is giving good, valid, or sound reasons to accept a conclusion. And so good. we just kind of pretend that, look, all these people are giving arguments for the existence of God from nature. We can see, we can see that. But then I started thinking, and their conclusions, Lewis, you and I and all Orthodox would accept. God is first cause. Um, he's designer. He's uh, the most real, right? Ends realism. Like all these different kinds of art, the conclusions that we Orthodox accept. And for some reason, we think that, therefore, all of kind of uh, what they're doing in natural, making natural theological arguments for the existence of God are valid or sound arguments. But then I thought about this, what's the problem? Does everybody in antiquity and through the history of philosophy have the same metaphysics, ontology, and epistemology and starting points? You have Plato's realism and Aristotle's uh, you know, kind of peripatetic uh, empiricism. You have you know, you know, nominalism later on and all these different things. And I realized, and then you have the, you know, the Stoics and different stuff like that. There's nobody who's presuppositionally and epistemically neutral. They all have different starting points in which they make arguments. But all those starting points and epistemology, the metaphysics and ontologies, they're all different, which means they can't all be correct. They might all be wrong. One might be correct, but they can't all be correct. So, what happens if from false premises you get to a true conclusion? Is that a good argument? Is it an argument that we should accept? And that's one of my problems. First and foremost, we get to start with natural theology. Simply because you get to something that you, is, is true, that we hold in orthodoxy, doesn't mean that it's a good argument. Remember what we talked about, true belief with the right sort of justification, not from, and I've used this example with my class and I, I told Jay about it, and he thought it was funny. We all believe that it's right to wash your hands after using the, the, the toilet. Now, we might not question things further. What if I think, why do you do that? 
Well, because it it increases the value of my Bitcoin. It balances the the the, the livestock in Montana, right? So that there's a stable, and that would be for the wrong reasons. So I think that's important. Let's start with that. That what are the epistemic starting points? What is their paradigm and is that correct? Because if it isn't, there are not going to be any good arguments for the existence of God. Okay, um, let me go on to then qualify. Obviously, I think that hinting on that, the incorrect starting points, what is false, would be these autonomous epistemological projects that we need a theonomous and orthodoxy again has a conception of natural theology and i'd argue that that's the correct sense of natural theology what is that to see and know god through his creation not through problematic or erroneous epistemic theories or philosophies or even through syllogistic inference so notice St. Paul talks about all men through creation know God. But suppress that. Well, how do they know that? If it says all men, that means children as well. So mm. is this the type of thing that most people, let's say in, in scholasticism, thought natural theology was? Uh, syllogistic inferences. Well, do three-year-olds, do they do cosmological arguments? Do they, they put together syllogisms and that's how they know. And it's interesting in David Bradshaw's book too, because he cites the fathers as saying that the fathers in Eastern Orthodoxy understood that not even discursively, but seeing God all at once. That there isn't this kind of mediation, right? That I've got to go through these steps. Now you can, you could do that correctly. I'm not saying that that excludes it, but what the apostle is saying and what the, the church fathers are is being able to see God and know him immediately at once through his creation of which you can then later develop arguments as far as kind of explaining how that's possible but only grounded in the revelatory theism delivered to man and preserved in the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church of Orthodoxy. Now, what's the difference? Orthodoxy holds that God is eminently present in the world through his divine energies. Remember, uh, St. Paul says it's in him we move, live, and have our being. And there is not is... Dimitri Staniloy, if um, you're all aware of the Orthodox Dogmatic Theology of the Experience of God, Volume 1, he says, look, and this is going to, I know I'm going on and pontificating, but this is really important because it shows the difference, what I believe, between the way the West during Christians understand uh, natural theology versus us. Dimitri Staniloy, Father Dimitri Staniloy, explains that there is not a separation between natural and supernatural theology or revelation. He states in the very beginning chapter, natural revelation is known and understood fully in the light of supernatural revelation. Or we might say that natural revelation is given and maintained by God continuously through his own divine act which is above nature. This is why St. Maximus, the confessor, does not posit an essential distinction between natural revelation and the supernatural biblical one, as we see Aquinas and other theologians do. So they'll, because of, and again, it goes back to certain presuppositions. God is absolutely divinely simple in his essence, according to Aquinas. He is mediated to creation by a series of uh, created cause and effect, a causal chain. Mm -hmm. That means he's not imminent within nature. 
Well, what's going to happen when you play that out? Well, that means that there really is an essential distinction between natural nature, natural revelation, and supernatural. God is not present in natural. There really is no natural revelation. It's natural causes that can be traced back to a supernatural cause. So they're immediately in this kind of dialectics opposition. God is transcendent and not imminently present in nature. And so to do natural theology is to start with pagan uh, autonomous epistemological starting points that you believe can actually by themselves without acknowledging that the supernatural revelation is what, again, continuously uh, guides and holds. What was it? What was it? Demetrius Stanis says that natural revelation is known and understood fully in the light of supernatural revelation. Again, they're, they're in, in the West and Western, you know, especially scholasticism, they're separated. And then you can pretend, even though God is the cause and ultimately ontologically grounds that and explains that, guess what? You can be an atheist and think that those are sufficient on them their own without grounding that in the supernatural revelation as the necessary con conditions of possibility of knowledge. I can start with that in an autonomous way and give a coherent account for how knowledge is possible that's not viciously circular, arbitrary, or self-defeating. We don't separate that. We believe, again, God is present in nature in his divine energies, and that's understood, not separated, but in the light of the supernatural revelation. So it's all revelation. You don't find that in actually Aquinas. You have reason, and then you have revelation. You have reason, and then you have faith. And so, like a lot of Western philosophy, you have categories of opposition. They're everything's in this kind of dialectical tension. To access, access God in faith is not to involve dionia. They're opposed. So faith and reason, scientific demonstration, they're not the same thing. They only overlap insofar as the object of intention is God. I believe that obviously that's bad natural theology. And orthodoxy, the way that I explained, especially in light of Dimitri Staniloy's explanation and reference to the divine energies, yes, you should be able to see God immediately, noetically. Um, all men with and not necessarily invoking syllogistic arguments and inferences, although notice we don't have dialectics of opposition, they're complementary. You can do that. Why? You can only do that because it's grounded in the supernatural revelation. Does that help kind of explain? I know it's a long explanation, but I think that's yeah. a really important question that you asked. So do you think that would, would this be a, a kind of a correct kind of gradient here so you'd have the sort of the the theonom the theonomous epistemologist like say you or you know calvinists or um you know the fathers as well uh but then on the other end you'd have kind of like secularists and descartes and then you, would you say that in the middle you have kind of the natural theologian in the sense that the natural theologian like aquinas would say that god is ultimately cause and therefore yes. You, 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 you know, you couldn't have knowledge without him. Right. Whereas Descartes would say you can have knowledge without God. But it's just in terms of the epistemological theory, there's a, a, a tension in the center. Is that is that the idea? Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Right. Um, yeah, those you, you have those kind of extremes. Aquinas is in the middle. And I think that's really why that probably marks, to be fair to Aquinas, he's not obviously have problems with Aquinas' his epistemology and his natural theology, but I don't think he's the father of modernity. <laughs> no, yeah. Whereas Descartes really is. And what what is modernity? It really is the death of God. I mean, even the theists, right? 
um, what did you say it was? It was it was putting your your metaphysical car before your epistemolo or epistemological horse, or the other way around. I forget which one it was. Um, the natural theology. Yeah, that's that's a good way of putting it. Putting your because it seems to me there's a tension. At least this is my understanding. I'll go on to another question, but it seems to me that there would be a tension for the natural theologian in the middle because, on the one hand, we want they want to say that you can have an autonomous epistemology, but then. It seems like God is ultimately what grounds every uh, knowledge, anyway. So, is, is, do, you, do, you, do you is that is that right? Yeah, uh, let me just ex kind of work through something. Maybe it'll help. Let's suppose the peripatetic axiom, of which Aquinas accepts, that the only he uses scientific knowledge. That's not what we contemporaries mean by like empirical sciences. That's Aristotle's uh, uh, valid deductive uh, syllogisms and arguments that uh, is supposed to be the highest kind of form of knowledge. Now, he would say that all knowledge comes from sense experience. There's nothing in the peripatetic axiom, there's nothing in the mind that was not first in the senses. Okay, well, that's a, an epistemic starting point, correct? And it, if you ask him, well, how do you know that? What are they going to say? I know that through the peripatetic axiom because all, because where did you learn that? Well, if you say everything. <laughs> it's in the mind comes from the senses, then the statement about the peripatetic axiom that everything in the mind is in the senses comes from that as well. Well, do you not know that that's viciously circular? As, as I always say to Jay, hey, just grant me all my presuppositions without having to defend or justify them, and then I'll make my case and prove it. I will not. <laughs> okay, that's the sense of autonomous, isn't it? I can't separate that out and give a coherent account for how knowledge is possible. Even if I were to accept those, they'd eventually reason out that the ultimate cause that makes all of that true is God. Because what you're starting with is you think that you can give a coherent account for how knowledge is possible from those principles alone. And that's not possible. That's one way to actually illustrate that is that, well, that's viciously circular, or arbitrary, or self-defeating. So that's the problem with, with natural theology, is I, I think that it assumes, it puts, like you said, the epistemological cart before the horse. It assumes what you actually want to prove without being able to establish what that proof is, the necessary conditions for the possibility of that. The only way that you're going to be able to do that is an ultimate reference to theistic revelation. So that's a problem. Um, even if you think that you can uh, eventually get to God. Why? Because how do I know starting off that I'm not completely deluded? My principles aren't wrong. Well, just grant me my principles, and then we'll know that we're right. Do you see that that's, that's mm -hmm. circular and problematic? Well, that goes into the next question, which is uh, the, the classical foundationalism and the, and the concept of what you call the given in the paper. Could you go into that a bit? Um, let's see. Yeah, do you want to talk a little bit about, before we go into that, I already talked a, a little bit about this with the problem with um, natural theology is the implication. I'll just finish up with this and then I'll go into the, mm -hmm. the, the next question. The implication of that is that you never have a direct relation to God. I was going to circle back to that, but you can go into that now if you want. Yeah, because I think that, well, yeah. God's not a creature, right? We all agree with that. Mm -hmm. Therefore, as Aquinas argues, because we do not see God face to face, we must be mediated to him through a series of created cause and effects. How do you know cause and effects, right? How do you grasp that through the intellect? Um, now, this alone, and this is going to illustrate and go back to the very notion of 
what they think natural theology and how those two realms are separated. Why? Because God is transcendent. He's not a creature. He's infinite. So he has the created world and you're in that. The only way to be mediated to God, if he's not eminently present and you don't have a direct face-to-face -face encounter, that you have to be mediated through a series of created cause and effects. And again, that's through the intellect. You know cause and effect through the intellect. And again, that's enough to demonstrate that if we are mediated to something through a causal chain, then obviously we have no direct revelation uh, relation, correct? That's what it means to be media <laughs> mediated versus immediate. However, it's worse than that. Since God's infinite mm. and his creation is finite, what does infinite mean? Not finite. You, you have two contraries. There's no proportionality between contraries, the infinite. And therefore, I can't even get to... <laughs> to God through the causal chain. There's a whole other host of problems too that um, from kind of peripatetic axiom, you can't get causality. That's another problem. So there's a whole host of things that again, incorrect epistemic starting points. And if you allow that and allow somebody to make an argument from there to get to God, then it's not a good argument simply because you get to a true conclusion. And all of Western natural theology is based on wrong epistemic starting points and wrong epistemological points in general that from my empiricism, I actually uh, can know and get causality. No, you can't. You can't perceive. There, there's no way to. And we'll go through more of that later. So that project's ultimately flawed um and this gets me into your question coming back uh classical foundationism correct and you wanted to know about the concept of the given mm -hmm. okay so let's just spell out real quick what classical foundationalism is um a foundation right where the word foundationalism or a non-inferential justified belief Sometimes we call those basic beliefs because they don't have to be inferred from other beliefs, i.e. a foundation. It's one that doesn't depend on any other beliefs for its justification. It's foundationally justified in itself. And so therefore, just really easily stated, foundationalism is a belief that any justified belief must either be foundational or depend on its justification ultimately on foundational beliefs. Uh, this goes back to originally to Aristotle. You can't have um, a series of inferences and demonstrative arguments where a demonstrative argument ad infinitum. Okay, so the justification for the conclusions of syllogism N is because of the prior syllogism and inferences, logical inferences, uh, the previous syllogism, so on and so on. And so unless there is an ultimate basic justification, none of those will be true. If you just keep giving, passing the buck, as it were, justification, well, if you don't get to the bottom of it, it doesn't stop somewhere, then none of it's justified is the idea that's the the issue the, the infinite regress an attempt to avoid the infinite regress and solve the problem of justification aristotle posited that there must be kind of foundational beliefs that are not dependent on other reasons or inferences does that make sense any questions about yep so epistemic foundationalism is a view about really the proper structure of one's knowledge or beliefs that your justified beliefs so some we would say some beliefs are known or justifiably believed only because as i illustrated with aristotle some other beliefs are known and justified and that's an epistemic dependence 
And that naturally arises questions about the proper epistemic status of beliefs. Should all beliefs be supported by all other beliefs? Are some beliefs rightly believed apart from receiving support from other beliefs? This is what the whole conversation is about. What's the nature of the proper support between those beliefs? Foundationalism is one view about how to actually answer those questions. And they maintain, a foundationalist that is, that some beliefs are properly basic. And they, the rest of your beliefs rest on that, that properly basic. Or let's put it another way. The rest of your beliefs inherit an epistemic status known as justification in virtue of receiving that status and proper support from the basicality, the basic belief. Um, and you get that foundation is usually divided up into two projects. A theory about proper basicality um, and what proper basicality is, is non-inferential justification. Then the other consideration in foundationalism is a theory about inferential justification. Okay, so I think that's kind of a fairly good brief intro into what foundationalism is and why it arose. Yeah. And so the given are these properly basic uh, self evident Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. Now, to be fair, there, there's all kinds of theories of foundationalism um, about the proper basicality. Some are fallibus and some are infallibus. Some will say that, no, you have, they have to be incorrigible and dubitable and stuff like that. And that's eventually what justifies. We only have to think about the kind of classical foundationalism of Descartes to think about that kind of more modern contemporary theories of foundationalism, they'll say, look, any belief can be fallible. All beliefs are fallible, right? That we don't need that to give kind of a proper account of the structure of basicality, non-inferential justification or inferential justification. So even among them, you'll have divided and divided and divided. It's basically like Protestantism of epistemology. <laughs> I'm, I'm skipping a question here. Okay, um, let's, and we'll come back to the givenness whenever you yeah. want, because that's important. And I'm, I'm, and I'm gonna skip the um, the causation question real quick. Um, but could you give like um, kind of something, because I, I also want you to talk about coherentism, which is the other theory of truth that you mentioned, which is one of the other ones other than foundationalism. Obviously there's infinitism, but I think very few people are- Yeah, are we don't really need to talk about that. Um, but could you, uh, explain sort of what coherentism is, contrast it to foundationalism, and then talk about the criticisms of foundationalism by coherentism. And then, like, we can talk about kind of the, the things you learn that are good or praiseworthy yeah. about coherentism. But also, presumably, there's praiseworthy things about foundationalism. So maybe you could... Um, yeah, that's what's yeah. nice about orthodoxy. I've always found that it's... You don't have to be like... I align with this and only this idea and everybody else is false and everything about this is true. Orthodoxy transcends all philosophies and epistemologies, right? So it allows us a, a, literally an epistemic privilege position to actually say, yeah, there's something correct about what the coherentists are saying, incorrect here. There's something about foundationalism in the sense of like inference that seems to be true. And um, so, yeah, I think that's a good point. I don't want to get stuck in those dialectics, okay? We transcend dialectics because uh, orthodoxy gives you the, the privileged epistemic status. Okay, yeah. so let's go into coherentism. And um, I'll quote Donald Davidson, 1986. Uh, Davidson puts it, quote, what distinguishes a coherence theory is simply the claim that nothing can count is a reason for a belief, except for another belief. Um, that's a great quote, uh, it really summarizes. The fact that our beliefs cohere and can establish their truth, even though each individual belief may lack justification entirely if considered 
in splendid isolation, or so is thought. So following C.I. Lewis, um, his book, 1940, uh, you can re reference 1946, some proponents think of this situation as analogous, analogous to how agreeing testimonies in court can lead to a verdict, although each testimony by itself would be insufficient for that purpose. Great analogy to kind of illustrate coherentism. There is no atomistic individualism, both in terms of semantical content and the structure of semantics and, uh, you know, veracity and justification. That ultimately meanings, and you get this in Quine too, when there's two dogmas of empiricism, the rejection of the verificationalist theory uh, that propositions have their meaning in this kind of isomorphic relationship. This has meaning because it's intentionally referring to that. That he was able to actually show that semantically this is grounded in a reference to a whole host of other concepts. And all, all of us are getting this from Immanuel Kant. We'd already been kind of thinking about this kind of conceptualism and marrying it with a sort of kind of empiricism um, rather than this kind of either or. And so likewise, it seems impossible. How can you have a justification for a belief that doesn't refer in some way to another belief. None of them stand alone. So meaning and justification are as, and I recommend this book to uh, John McDowell, Mind and World, where he refers to the space of reasons, um, the conceptual sphere, that there are no givens. There are no isolated uh, things that can stand on their own it is either semantic givens or justifications that they'll always repeal, appeal to the conceptual sphere to receive their content and uh, rational relations. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that can justify is logical, rational relations, which you find in the spare, uh, the space of reasons. Space of reasons, by the way, is the term um, coined by Wilford Sellers, and um, let's see what, it's one of his lectures. I thought it was EPM. No, it is EPM. Yeah. Okay. So Sellers goes on in EPM, Empiricism, Philosophy of Mind, to say many things have been said to be given. Sense contents, material objects, universals, propositions, real connections, first principles, even given itself is said to be a given. And he identifies these, a lot of these people, which he's going to attribute the word myth of the given to, it's their myth, are the sense datum theorists. And he says they characteristically distinguish between an act of awareness, for example, a color patch, which is its object, which makes me now think exactly, I didn't even think about this until... You know, my PhD advisor, um, James O'Shea, had written this book on Wilford, Wilford Sellers. And notice the pink ice cube. Why did he actually choose that? Well, he's actually referencing Wilford Sellers right there, the color patch, which is the object. And that act is usually called the sensing. The classical exponents of that theory have often characterized these as going back to the notion of basicality, cognitive states. So there could be beliefs or cognitive states that are basic. They don't get their justification from other reasons or beliefs. They're phenomenologically simple. You don't need to analyze it any further. So notice that's a, a pure denial of coherentism that you could actually have things that are phenomenologically simple, that you could have cognitive states, propositions, or beliefs that don't appeal to other beliefs. And again, this goes back to a lot of this coherentism to Immanuel Kant. Um, every scene, actually, let, let me rewind real quick because this is a, a great line if you haven't heard. 
Um, intuitions, and by intuitions, right, like the kind of sense datum, intuitions without concepts are blind. You've probably heard that, that famous Kantian. Um, and so what we actually, that's a statement that you can't have anything that's phenomenologically simple. In other words, let me retranslate that. Every sensing, every scene is a scene as, a scene as according to what? The sphere of, you know, the concepts, the space of reasons. And that is, again, coherentism. All of those, that space of reasons cohere together. And like the analogy of the courtroom, all those testimonies is what actually becomes sufficient to make a verdict. And the other one is insufficient to do what it wants. And the analogy here being to provide semantical content or justification. Um, should I go on? Am I going too far into this? No, you're doing great. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So since datum theorists believe that it is particulars that are sensed, but Sellers points out uh, – what is known even in non-inferential knowledge, that kind of basicality of phenomenally simple, is facts rather than particulars. I found that interesting. Items of the form, something's being thus so-and-so, such and such, or something standing in a certain relation to something else. So it's not particular. Particulars doesn't even make sense. It's facts. And that would seem then that the sense, the sensing of sense contents cannot constitute um, knowledge, inferential or non-inferential knowledge, because that's what they want to say, right? Uh, the myth of the given. You can have cognitive states or this kind of basicality that can provide justification for inferences, or that the state itself, non-inferential, is, is justified in my, my sensing. But we find out that cognitive states are not epistemic. Um, here's an example I give. It appears to S that P, apples, appears red, or that ice cube appears pink. Is not a fact, nor is it a proposition, but rather it's a sensing. Therefore, it cannot be epistemic, right? So that's going back to Sellers. What's epistemic? Facts are epistemics. How are sensings epistemics? How can they constitute inferential or non-inferential knowledge? It doesn't make um, any sense. So I'd like to bring up what Donald Davidson says, and this is part of the critique that coherentism has of foundationalism. He states and a coherence theory of truth. Donald Davidson states the relation between sensation and a belief. Isn't that what's on the table, correct? Can sensations, those phenomenal um, things that are simple, that are not further analyzed by other reasons or other justifications or other inferences. The relation between a sensation and a belief cannot be a logical one. That goes back to what I was saying. Justification and logical relations deals with facts, not um, basicality and phenomenal simples. So, a sensation and belief, that relation cannot be logical since sensations are not beliefs, they're not facts, nor are they other propositional attitudes. That is, they're not formulated in conceptual terms. Donald Davidson asks, well, what's the relation then? The answer is, I think, obvious. The relation is causal. Mm -hmm. Sensations cause some beliefs, and in this sense, are the basis or grounds of beliefs. And then he goes on to say, however, a causal explanation of belief does not show how or why the beliefs justified. Therefore, you know, basicality, sensations, the givens can never be justifications. Pretty good, huh? It's a pretty good argument. I mean, there's so much more to you that we can actually. Is, isn't this kind of assuming uh, maybe the, the 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 person being critiqued is uh, like a uh... Or like a phenom, like a phenom, phen uh, what's the word? Phenomenal. A phenomenologist. Phenomenologist, or someone who believes in like 
like a representationalist theory of perception or something or do you think it works for like any kind of theory of perception because they just all involve sense data is that what the idea is um the only one that i think that it wouldn't apply to is uh, a cartesian rationalist okay so he seems to be directing this at a sort of empiricism right that because anybody whether it's the phenomenologist or just a classical foundationalist is going to say ultimately that's grounded in the kind of first principles of sense perception okay mm -hmm. what gives rise to um, those beliefs they're grounded in sense perception the only people that i can think that deny that are rationalists like Car mm -hmm. descartes right so descartes doesn't actually provide that he grounds it in um, this incorrigible and dubitable um, ideas um, or appearance, right? And so he thinks that, like, how can my appearing be wrong? But he can, he believes that he can attempt to do that without any reference to an actual empirical, sensible, phenomenological world. Um, so perhaps we'd make a different critique for, but it obviously sellers and Davidson and, and the like, I have somebody particular in mind, uh, I would say in their critiques, um, somebody like the classical exponents of, of a, you know, i.e. the sense of datum theorists, which for the most just, part, just a little um, side segue. Um, so it sounds like perhaps this kind of critique itself might not work against someone who wants to make uh, natural theology arguments for the existence of God, where the starting points are not empirical, but they're a priori. Is that right? Yeah. If you notice in my paper, I address that because I mm -hmm. bring up the, the Descartes that... Um, The problem, what does apply though, is that even if you start with an a priori idea, you're still assuming that that's properly basic in a foundationalist sense, that it makes no reference to other beliefs or the sphere mm -hmm. of reason. Um, and that seems to be easily demonstrated as false, that, like, that all beliefs uh, both semantically in terms of justification. And I have a series of different arguments to actually show that that ends up in order. Let me see. Do you want me to pull it up real quick? Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. S is justified in P. So let's su suppose. Um, and you could be P could be you know some phenomenal state of a sense datum theorist, but for this let's let's take kind of a Cartesian. It's a properly basic, incorrigible, um, indubitable idea. Now, we could say person S is justified in believing that. Only if the belief that that P is a justification is justified. The statement, S is believed that P is a justification. Okay, so notice we're taking a meta level. The statement now is either a belief or a reason. Either belief, that reason is justified or it's not. If the belief or reason is justified, it's either justified by the first thing we stated, P, or another belief. If that belief, that meta statement, right, about justification is justified by P, then it's viciously circular. <laughs> if that belief, that meta statement about P's justification is justified by another belief, then we have what? A denial of foundationalism or an infinite regress. Therefore, this reason or belief that meta belief about the justification, the original premise that needs to follow in that argument for the foundationalist, 
um, that P is a justification is not justified. Therefore, normative foundation is false. Pretty good, huh? So that's the takeaway from coherentism. That's the... Yeah, the yeah, that's, that was an argument that I designed to kind of illustrate, that I took from some insights from coherentism. I, I kind of tried to boil down coherentism's critiques um, to actually show that, look, ultimately, it's, yeah, foundationalism is not a justified project. And what the, I do think that that shows is it's making reference to other beliefs, even if it's ultimately circular, which co coherentism believes that ultimately everything's kind of like circular, maybe not in a, viciously, a vicious way, but in the sense of that all beliefs are going to come back on, if they're all connected, ultimately, and both semantically in terms of justification, you're going to come back just like the courtroom. If you're analyzing if you make the verdict based on all of the testimonies, then in analyzing the verdict, aren't you going to eventually make your way back around to each and every one of the testimonies? Right. So the solution to all this, <laughs> uh, and because of taking on all of the different insights from other theories of truth, for the orthodox epistemology, you are going to talk about transcendental arguments. Mm -hmm. And I suppose before I ask the, about the structure of a transcendental argument, um, could you explain a little bit about the distinctions between what a transcendental is, all the different kind of words for transcendental or transcendent or... Yes. Um, so etymologically, it transcends a Latin... Latin word, sendere, um, means to climb out or above, trans, over, across. So in just kind of a basic sense, the things that, it, that have, are out, over, and above. Um, Saturn and Venus transcend Earth. Why? They're climbed out, over, and above. Okay. Uh, so that's just a kind of basic sense of, of things transcending. Now, people get really confused because they think when they hear transcendental argument that that necessarily connects to any word that has transcendental or transcend in it. And that's not the case. That's another kind of word concept fallacy. The use in antiquity of transcendentals would be certain categories like being, goodness, unity, uh, beauty. Those would be transcendentals. Transcendentalism, totally different of like Thoreau, is a literary, uh, you know, and kind of cultural movement or something. And transcendental categories are a modern a modern idea from Immanuel Kant that there are certain logical a priori categories of the mind that are necessary to make sense of sense, experience and data. Yeah, experience, yeah. Okay, where people get confused, and then, let me, one more, then there are transcendental arguments. Now, among the species of arguments, typically we know of deductive arguments, okay, where you infer the conclusion from premises, prior premises, that if those premises are true, then the conclusion follows. Then there's inductive, where basically kind of generalizations from particular um, statements to either another particular or you infer to from particulars to a universal. So they're both types of argument, one probabilistic and one deductive that you infer to the conclusion. A transcendental argument is different. Rather than affer uh, you know inferring to the conclusion, it's a type of argument 
whose conclusion must be accepted as true in order to have any sorts of arguments or sense perception or things. So it's kind of an indirect or an inverted. So rather than getting to the conclusion, you're able to discover that unless that conclusion were true, then none of these arguments would actually be true or any kind of inference. That's a transcendental argument. Now watch everybody get all those things confused. So Immanuel Kant has a transcendental argument. He's the one that really kind of coins that term. What are the necessary conditions for the possibility of sense experience and knowledge? Um, well, we know that there has to be causality, but the problem is mm -hmm. you can't, from empiricism, deduce causality. You can't, there's just one dang thing after another. There's correlation, but no causation. But causation is necessary in science. It's necessary in knowledge, a certain type of, of causality, at least necessary. It's not a, a sufficient condition, but it's a necessary condition. And so... He locates that within the a priori categories of a perception in the mind, ultimately under the a priori categories of space and time. So they're not things out there in the empirical world. They're the necessary conditions that are assumed that makes the world of experience possible, makes predications possible, makes knowledge. Um, now, some people have then made transcendental arguments for the existence of God. And they've started at different points. Oftentimes you heard, how do you give an account for the logical categories of reason? Um, universals being abstract, um, invariant, um, correspond to reality, etc. And then you find the necessary condition that makes that possible in the same way that if you're looking at a cake, you'd say, what's the necessary ingredients to make that possible? Well, I've got to have eggs, uh, butter, flour. I have a cake, therefore I must have eggs, butter, and flour. They'll make an argument that way by rather than looking at cakes, they look at transcendental categories, logical categories, and then conclude the necessary condition is God. But that's not what makes it a transcendental argument. It's not because they start from transcendental categories. We can start from sense experience. We can start from pencils. We can start from morality. Okay. What makes it transcendental is there's something behind as a necessary condition that makes such and such possible, without which we wouldn't be able to have this. We do have this, therefore, again, we must assume the conclusion to be true in order to explain that. And I, I'm glad you asked that question because people get really confused because those terms are all over, can mean different things. And they think that a transcendental argument is only if you uh, make an argument from uh, logical trans, transcendent categories of, of the mind. And that's not the case. So could you uh, give us what the, because you then turn it in the paper, you turn it into a couple of modus ponenses. Yes. Here's my, what I'm curious about is, first of all, can you just, yeah, just show us the structure of the transcendental one, and then you, the modus ponenses you turn it into, but then, um, I, I have it here if you need it. But I'll then, just pull it out real quick. But then, if, I suppose one question might be, well, if you can just turn it into a modus ponens, wow, what's the whole point of the transcendental premise and all that stuff? And what's the, is, is it just a, is it just a perspective shift that you're doing or is it something else? I think it's a pedagogical. So it's not putting the modus ponens epistemically prior. Hmm. Um, that would be self-defeating. Yeah. Of, um, it's, taking the language and inferences and arguments that we already use to kind of illustrate what's going on uh, what actually is epistemically prior the transcendental argument 
So it would be like this. We we use words, even if, and we assume you know it has semantic content and things like that. Even if we can't actually give an account for how that's possible. And then somebody asks us to actually give an account, you're going to use words and semantics. Mm. Now, nobody would say, ah, gotcha. You're putting, you're begging the question. You're putting that. It's like, no, I'm, I'm making the distinction that whatever grounds that is prior, even though I'm still using words. So I do the same thing with a modus ponens. It's admitted with a transcendental argument in order for this to even be possible, this necessary condition must be, i.e. the transcendental argument is epistemically prior. However, this is moving as a way to explain that. And I think that's fine without begging the question. And I think that's what you were getting at, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a way to explain what's, be, what's even behind that and what would even be gr grounding modus ponens. Because if the transcendental argument is true, then modus ponens is true. If modus ponens is true, then I can go back and actually use that to explain what's epistemically prior um, that's discovered in a transcendental argument. Do you think that's why when a lot of people first encounter it and actually think about it, they, they, they think it's some kind of like linguistic trick or something like that? Do you think... Do you think that might have to do with it? Yeah, say some more. That's interesting. Well, it's like, I mean, every time I've heard people use a transcendental argument, especially in the server, people seem to kind of think like, oh, well, you're just kind of like it's like it's a trick or you're, you're, I remember Jay used to joke about this a lot, but it makes it sound like it's a linguistic trick because you're using, you're talking about preconditions. And in a sense, it, it seems to me like to an extent it it's, not only is it an actual argumentative shift, but it's also a perspective shift, which is difficult for, for people, I think. Well, let's think about like, what happens when people feel that there's a trick or they've been tricked? Um, tricks admit of something like uh, an ignorance, right? I didn't know they were gonna do that. Or I didn't, I don't actually know what's going on, um, but somehow we're at the other town, you tricked me, right? Mm. So always in the notion of trick, there's a, an element of unfamiliarity or uh, ignorance. And I think that's ultimately why people feel that this is a trick. They're ignorant of, they never use these arguments. In fact, some people might not even know that these in within logic and philosophy are considered to be at least uh, in its structure, valid arguments. Um, along with deductive arguments. And because of that, they feel tricked, because of, which is simply just admitting, I'm not actually familiar with this, or there, I have a certain kind of ignorance, and I don't know how I actually got to that, but I don't know how to object to it either. I think that's probably kind of the underlying mm -hmm. feeling of why people feel tricked. Can you uh, talk us through the structure then? Okay, so... Again, if we started with the cake example, if there's cake, then there's obviously some necessary ingredients. Okay, it, and that's a true proposition. Premise two, there is cake, therefore there must be some necessary ingredients called X. That's the structure. That's the kind of bare bones of a modus ponens in which the antecedent stands as a sufficient condition and the consequent is the necessary condition. So what does that mean? Sufficient means enough. If you have this, it's enough to um, have the other. Uh, let me give you an example. But sufficient mean, uh, admits there's other ways to get it. Feeling 
bad. It's just um, having the flu is is a sufficient condition for feeling bad. What does that mean? If you have the flu, you're going to feel bad. It's a nut. But it's not necessary because think about all the different ways that you could actually feel bad. It's just if you get this, it's enough to get that, the bad feeling. Um, now, I have the antecedent flu and the consequent feeling bad. The antecedents are sufficient it's enough to feel bad. But guess what? Feeling bad, the consequent, the necessary condition, is a necessary condition for having the flu. That it's impossible um, to have the flu without feeling bad. Okay, so there's a certain logical relation in conditionals between sufficient and necessary. We're trying to establish what? We're already admitting that there's a sufficient thing out there, whether it's the cake or the flu or knowledge. What we're trying to establish transcendentally is, is the conclusion is the necessary condition for the possibility of those sufficient conditions. Cake, feeling, having the flu, or knowledge and experience, okay? Now, what you're gonna have to find out is <clears throat> what would actually satisfy what is a necessary condition i'm just giving you kind of the bare structure of the argument it's a further step to actually see does this satisfy can i use um let's see can i use sand in a cake can that be a necessary condition and it turns out it can't, right? And so we'll have to go through that. But I just want to give you the, the general structure. So if y, then x. y, therefore x. So if knowledge and experience exists, what I'm going to argue is then God exists. We admit knowledge and experience exists, therefore the necessary condition, the possibility that God, God exists. And we need to go further and to see how does that satisfy and what does even the word God mean. But first, I just need to give the kind of valid structure of the argument that if those premises are true, then the conclusion will necessarily follow. Uh, questions about that? That's just... And then I give a modal. We don't have to go into the modal. It's just to make the argument stronger that that would yep. apply in every possible world. Yeah, yeah. I see that one on the bottom of page 10, yeah. Oh, it's up to you. You can you can go more on that if you want or So, then what I do is I make a disjunctive. Mm -hmm. That well, there's only two ways to go. Cuz if somebody says they're going to deny, remember a valid argument is if the premise is true, the conclusion has to be true. Well, an atheist or agnostic is going to deny the conclusion God exists. So that means, well, they're not going to deny premise two that knowledge and experience exist. Um, they have to deny premise one. Uh, if knowledge and experience exists, then God exists. So I've got to take, I have to defend number one, correct? Yeah, which, as I say in the questions, it seems like that's a lot of uh, legwork. <laughs> that's a lot of... Oh, it's super easy. With my 10 step plan that you can subscribe to you with a payment plan, I'll actually help you see this in 10 easy steps. Mm -hmm. How about that? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, um, let's make it easy. It's an either or. Either God. So how am I going to defend one? By the previous uh, syllogism, disjunctive syllogism. Either God is a necessary condition or not. So either A or not A. Okay, they're not going to deny that. But what they're going to deny is premise two. It cannot not be God. So not not A. If it's not not A, it's therefore A. Therefore, God's a necessary condition for the possibility of knowledge. Okay, that's just step two. Next, what I need to do is to show that 
to say that not God is a defeater for the possibility of knowledge. That would be the third argument. And I could boil that down into, again, another disjunctive. What do we typically mean by, look, the universe, um, what's, our, uh, what's our explanation of all the things that you want to say in about the universe? So the laws of physics, um, the regu- uh, that uh, the past, the future will resemble the past, the regularity of nature, and the immutability of truth, uh, physical laws, sense perception, morality, etc. All the different things that people just kind of assume without giving reasons. Ultimately, again, there's nobody that's presupposition or ideologically neutral. There's a reason behind why they believe that. There's a story. Well, ultimately, it doesn't matter what religion or what philosophy, it's going to boil down to this disjunctive. Either behind all of that is a being who's all-knowing, who's good and loving and purposefully with intention creates the world. So he makes, because he has purpose, it accounts for just like the eggs and uh, butter would account for how, and not rocks or sand. That would account for well, why is morality objective? Why are uh, there laws, you know, the physical laws? Why is the future going to resemble the past? It's going to regularity through nature, identity over time. Um, that's, you know, if our faculties are constructed correctly, that we can actually know the world how logical categories both relate to one another and to the other world, because there's a good loving God who's omniscient, all knowing, um, who purposely creates it that way. Okay, so there's a story that can account for that. Well, is it the only story? Well, what's the other option? The story where there is no God, there is no purposeful intention. What's the opposite of purposeful intention? If you crash your car purposely into the wall versus it was an accident. So you have purposeful intention versus accidentalism. That's the disjunctive. Now let's actually think about what does it mean to have accidentalism as your epistemic first principle that explains everything in the universe. Accidental laws of physics, accidental knowledge, accidental identity, accidental truth. These are oxymorons that, if it were true, invalidates and makes even what you're saying a uh, psycho battle, let alone not being justified. Because the disjunctive, not A, is a defeater for knowledge, therefore A. So I don't think it's a lot of legwork. I think that's what you do. You've got to boil it down into disjunctives. Hmm. Great. Um but so then the follow up is someone might say, well, but doesn't this work for basically any kind of theism? Like, so could you talk about why you think that the Orthodox Christian God is specifically the, the precondition? Yeah. So notice it's not arbitrary. It's not simply we plug in any X. God is just a term. Um, and so we need to know what that actually means and it's not a proper name in fact it's not a rigid designator and this is going to be important too that it's what we call a flaccid uh, uh, designator in philosophy language and logic that means there is no kind of common conception of what god means that that takes on its specific meaning not by the lowest common denominator um, but by the conjunctions that's given by that religion of other properties of which they can't exist apart right it's like saying um everybody has two arms Therefore, there is some object to which 
two arms refers to. Well, it doesn't. It's it's flaccidly uh, d designated. Um, that that only exists in conjunction with a lose, with heart, or like an instantiation. Okay, so that's really important. So the term God, and this comes back to some of the coherentism too, the myth of the given. There is not any just kind of neutral, run-of-the-mill, lowest common denominator of what God means. But it takes its rigid designation by the whole coherent paradigm and cannot exist outside of that. And what I'm going to actually show then is that what well, we need to actually define that. And then we actually have to see of those con uh, conjunctive properties of God, what would actually satisfy? Are there in another religious paradigm the way God, because God, is, that term is going to mean God. something different in every philosophy, in every paradigm. So we need to make a paradigmatic analysis and then look, is there anything in that concept of which they refer to God that would be a defeater for knowledge, that would make knowledge impossible? And then again, I'm going to put it into a disjunctive because the fathers treat uh, orthodoxy as a system in toto that admits that it's the fullness of truth, that nothing else, i.e. the disjunctive, is the fullness of truth. Either orthodoxy in toto is true or it's not. And if the not and not is, i.e. if I'm able to actually show in that disjunctive that that would make knowledge impossible, then orthodoxy in toto, the system, the entire revelation must be true. And further evidence of that is everything in the system that which speaks about God satisfies in very much the same way that uh, butter and flour does for the possibility of cake, in this case, knowledge. Okay, so let's go through. Suppose, let's put it this way. Um, we're not in a position, as I had illustrated with the problems of a autonomous epistemology, and as we saw that in the Western projects of natural theology in a position from our epistemic starting points to coherently give an account for how knowledge is possible and how we obtain the necessary conditions of knowledge without being viciously circular. So either just grant me all my assumptions without me justifying, then I'll prove my case viciously circular, or ultimately if my faculties are in question, then to do an autonomous epistemology and where I construct that apart from God and revelatory theism, what am I going to do? I'm going to reference exactly what's in question to prove and solve that. But if I'm the problem, if I'm in the position where I can't know, I'm not in an epistemic privileged position, if I don't know if I'm schizophrenic or if any of this stuff works, I can't have reference that to prove my case. So again, it's either arbitrary um, or viciously circular. So I need to be in a particular relation, the one who is not in a position to know with the necessary conditions for the possibility of knowledge. But what did I say? In order to relate to things, which is exactly what we want, we need a mean proportion because you cannot relate contraries and opposites. Okay, so can I just plug in God and it just works? No, it's not we're just saying God. It's not God of the gaps. It's not arbitrary. It's what God has been revealed to us and how any other conception of God would be a defeater for knowledge. So if God was a transcendent in the Greek sense, monad, an impersonal kind of monad, pure being or something like that, um, infinite being. How does that relate to creation? It's not imminent. 
Um, and it's in the categories of opposition. The world is multiplicity. Uh, God is monad, is one. God is infinite. The finite, the, the created world's finite. Um, God is, again, transcendent. I have no middle term to relate to those things. So simply positing a Greek God isn't going to work. And then somebody says, well, the mediation is obviously his cause and the, the causal mm -hmm. chain. Well, again, you have the assumption that God is an infinite cause. It's not the assumption, it's true. God is the infinite cause and the created causal chain is finite. There is no bridge. And second of all, it presupposes that from my own autonomous starting points that I can't actually justify this, the created mythological story that I make up when I'm the one in question, um, all has to be true about causation, about how the mind works, um, in order for me to then establish, oh, there is causality, and the principle of sufficient reason, and that I actually can make, at least an imperfect through an analogy of Entis, um, reasoning process from finite created effects to an infinite. You can't do that. That's a problematic. That's arbitrary and viciously circular. So that fails. You never get to the necessary conditions for the possibility of knowledge. Also, knowledge is personal. We're persons. So I don't stand as far, like there has to be, again, a middle term. If God is monad, strictly monadic, he can't be personal intrinsically. Somebody might say, well, then the, the great I am enters into a relationship with Abraham, Moses. And that's why he's personal. Well, then he's personal at extra, not, not internally. That's not what he is. It's something he takes mm -hmm. on in relation to creation. Okay, so, well, then that seems to be a problem because I'm personal. The way that I incorporate and instantiate these things and relate is in a personal way. There can be no such thing as unpersonal knowledge. So if the necessary, if I'm to obtain the necessary conditions for the possibility of knowledge in that relation, I the thing being related to the necessary condition, there has to be a mean proportion. That means that God must be personal. If God's personal, he can't be monad because person implies relation. So he has to at least be dyad. But dyad is simply a principle of distinction, anotherness. So Either you have two gods, which is problematic, or it's the same god, but then you have a problem of dialectical opposition. How are the two that are different the same? Triad. Um, that the third person completes the dialectic of opposition. The three are one. Um, and they're personal. And they're relation. They're relational. So... Any other number is superfluous because it's a uh, multiplication of either one, two, or three. So God needs to be, if he's going to be personal, triadic. Okay. Well, that still doesn't solve the problem for me because how does he relate to the world? If I'm mediated through just, he just creates, right? I don't actually have an encounter with that. Right? There is no immediacy. That means I have to presuppose my whole autonomous made up story, mythology, and assume that it's true and just grant me my story is true so I can prove that my story is true um, for that to be case. So problematic. Therefore, God must be eminent. That's the divine energies. But furthermore, he becomes one of us. He's incarnate. The one who is the necessary condition for the possibility of knowledge and logic, the Logos, is a person. And that we are made in that person so that there's a, in the image of that person, the Logos, the second person of the Holy Trinity. And by becoming incarnate, 
the second person of the Holy Trinity, um, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, assumes universal nature. He doesn't just make an appearance into creation and is imminent. He unites us so that now the necessary, we have the most intimate union with the necessary conditions for the possibility of knowledge. And we're told this in John's gospel. Um, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and he was the light of men. He is the light. He is the teacher, as St. Augustine says, that makes possible all knowledge. And he isn't distant from us. He's united in our very nature through the incarnation, such that if through the mode of repentance is, I show in St. Isaac the Syrian's theory of knowledge from St. Justin Popovich, that through the mode of metonian repentance, we may be able to clean our noose and be able to actually see the light that enlightens the whole world and in that process become even more united in what we're called theosis. Anything that does not have that, and orthodoxy uniquely does have that, there is no other theology or philosophy that has that conjunctive, the system in toto, as St. Irenaeus says, that then claims it's either the system in toto um, or this is false. Anything else is a defeater for knowledge, not this, therefore, orthodoxy. That's the argument that I present. And we're able to see how all of those satisfy this, the necessary conditions that make um, morality, that make sense experience and knowledge possible, and uniquely so. And that's all I have to do, such that there is no longer any objection to orthodoxy. Why? Because then that's to make a pretended autonomy. That's to set something up, right, that you're saying doesn't need any justification. But when I analyze it, first of all, that's, that's incorrect. Second of all, when I analyze that, I'm going to find that you're not presuppositionally or ideologically neutral. You hold to certain things that, like I said, what the heck does accidental laws of physics mean? Accidental knowledge that that's an oxymoron. Knowledge admits that it cannot be accidental, right? That therefore, my other principles in my worldview that I hold to that are not orthodox actually end up becoming a defeater for all reasoning and knowledge. And therefore, there is no objection to orthodoxy. Why? Because objections have to admit uh, that they're valid, that you can actually do that and you can justify that. You can't do that. Therefore, my apologetic work is done. I have defended orthodoxy. Excellent. Yeah. I don't even think it's necessary to ask the last two questions. I think you did such a good job uh, covering it all, to be honest. Um, Thanks. I don't know if there's anything else you want to say. Um, I think what makes the incarnation unique as well is that we have a notion of hypostatic union. Yes. As far as I'm aware, I don't think, I don't think any other religion has a notion of hypostatic union and the idea of man as, as a, as microcosm of, of creation. I don't. Right. Those are two really important um, things too. And, you know, the very doctrine of universal recapitulation um, and union. So even if you said there were, certain kind of theophanies in which the God becomes present. Uh, that's not the same thing as orthodoxy. Krishna coming down and making a theophany um, is not, he's not assuming universal human nature and uniting. Um, and I'm not even clear in Hindu theology what it actually means for Krishna to actually make an appearance, given their very understanding, uh, their, their epistemology, and their view of what the material world is, and Maya, and these different things. Um, so there's no comparison if somebody says, well, they have. It's like, no, they don't. We're not saying a hologram. A hologram of God came down through a causal chain that we have no immediacy to. And, and by the way, 
Um, I have no reasons to actually even uh, accept that my my perceptions and sense uh, my senses are reliable. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> how is that a great solution? Like elephant-headed, multi-armed. That's not a human, is it? Not, <laughs> I mean, I don't know how to. I mean, that's just one thing I think of, but yeah. Well, wonderful. Yeah, I mean, if you have any other questions, I thought that was a great, I had great questions. I hope that um, a lot of you that that satisfied some of your curiosity. Again, there's just a general unfamiliarity, um, and with anything, right? The more that you kind of dig into the literature of what transcendental arguments are, the more that you kind of dig into the methodology and the, the apologetics of the fathers, you'll begin to see how really different that project is from what um, they're doing in the West. Yeah. And um, I think it just becomes more familiar. It, it, it's elucidated. You start to go, okay, I'm getting it. I'm going to um, read out some super chats but before I do oh, that. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to um, encourage people to uh, become patrons. Uh, all the money we make goes towards buying books to make more videos and interview more scholars for the edification of people here uh also with respect to islam uh this isn't a standalone video this isn't a standalone stream um there's going to be an interview with i don't want to uh mention his name but uh uh yeah uh but um somebody big never surprised but uh it is going to be a, a muslim who's going to come on and uh talk about epistemology as well and then i will have him and uh father deacon and Anias have a conversation um towards the end of the month, basically. So um, here are the super chats. Uh, Pano Kosturos, thank you, $20. Thank you very much. Would it be fair to say classical foundationalist epistemology suffers from the same spirit as the builders of the Tower of Babel, building a path to paradise from pitch brick, i.e. self-evident maxims? Yeah, we didn't even get into the notion of self-evident. By the way, uh, the... The appeal of self-evident is the resort of every despot, <laughs> epistemological despot. <laughs> you can quote me on that. Every philosopher just uses it as a way to, I don't have to justify myself. Um, it's self-evident. And how do I know that? Either, well, you just got to grant me that. I don't have to, it's self-evident. I don't have to justify that. What's the kind of end of conversation? Or it's self-defeating because then they give you a whole host of reasons um, why a self-evident proposition or a basic belief um, is self-evident. So it's not self-evident anymore. Um, but you're right. It is sort of kind of a tower of Babel. Let me do it on my own. Let me construct. Because there's sort of kind of independence, right, to the notion of self-evident. It doesn't need in order for it to be a justification to any other appeal to the sphere of reasoning. But part of that, what we would admit as orthodox, is, yeah, one of the reasons that that's actually true and a, a, a something could be a justification is because of God. So if you say that something's truly self-evident, then you can say it's at least at some level, and everybody's going to flesh this out in different ways, it's independent of God. We can start our own Tower of Babel. So, yes, thank you, Pan, a great point. Uh, and the question, next question is from T Torch on uh, $5. Thank you very much. How are we not subject to the same critiques of coherentism just because a web is consistent doesn't mean it's true? And what about found herentism? Yeah, I think you addressed this, uh, but go ahead. So again, we're, we're not coherent. We're just saying that the way nature, the nature of semantics and language and justifications work is that that things adhere. The reason why we're not open to the same criticism is fundamentally this: a coherence theory offers no positive argument for justification. It can have a negative argument, i.e. a criticism towards foundationalism, but that doesn't make coherentism true. Again, it assumes, that's just one thing that we hope for, 
uh, with knowledge is that our things are actually coherent. Um, but the big one we're looking for is justification. So the problem with all coherentist theory is it is autonomous epistemology, right? It is man starting from the starting point, autonomous epistemic starting point that just grant me that my coherent epistemic holism, i.e. my paradigm, is the justification. And I don't have to justify that. Um, that makes it not a justification. I put this in my paper. Well, what's your criteria for your justification criteria? You cannot then use what's in question, i.e. you, the autonomous uh, epistemological project. Well, what's the, the, if that can't work, if that can never pri provide a criteria for one's justification criteria, then it must be a theonomous. Mm. So it's precisely because we don't system build. We're not constructing this on our own epistemic uh, autonomous principles, whether that be foundational or coherentist, that makes knowledge possible and we're not open to um, the same critique. It's a revelatory theism. It's admitting the possibility that we could do that. And therefore, the only other possibility must be a theonomous epistemology. And could you comment on what you think uh, about found if uh, if you know much about that or? Um, I don't know too much about, but it's going to be the same. Look, I mean, it's what philosophers always do. You come up with one critique and they're like, okay, but what if I add this? Okay, then it's going to be informed beliefs. Oh, you have an objection. I'll just add this, right? Simply just continuing the conversation, which is really the whole history of philosophy. Right? Mm. Somebody thinks that they've actually solved yeah. the problem and the next guy shows like, you yeah, haven't done anything. And then the next guy's, well, I'll just do this. And then that's destroyed. And then that's destroyed. Um, let's just take a step back and realize the whole problem is, as St. Paul says, vain philosophy built on the traditions of men. Autonomous yeah. epistemology. You never get to it. You never yeah. get to it. No, you never get to... And then that's why some people will, will conclude like an almost a Wittgensteinian, well, it's not about finding the truth. It's the whole process. What's like, well, that's mm. dumb. It, like, where are we going? <laughs> I don't want to go for a ride if we're not actually going anywhere. Right? <laughs> so no, again, it's, it's good. Really What's that? <laughs> no, but the ride's really fun. The for ride's that. really fun. Um, so foundational, uh, what do we called it? Uh, what was the, the term that we just used? Found, uh, found heretism. Found heretism. Whatever the details are going to be that thinks it solves whatever particular problem, it's going to be if it's a autonomously constructed epistemology, it's the same problem. Like it makes it really easy to deal with. Yeah. So as I understand, what makes orthodox epistemology unique is a combination of its metaphysics and ethics, which sort of mutually work together with epistem epistemology to make it uh, unique rather than something that's, uh, you know, like just coherentism or just foundationalism. Is that right? Yeah. I want to answer this question too. It's not a super chat, but this brings up, why wouldn't that, uh, why wouldn't that be, it's an axiom and not something down the line from that. Do axioms need to avoid circularity? Um, very, e I've heard this people bring up objections. It's axiomatic. I don't need to justify um, okay, then it's all, I mean, it's such a, a weird argument because then I can make anything I want an axiom. I don't have to justify it. Why? Because it's an axiom. Well, then that means there is no, it isn't a justification. If I'm just like, well, rock, rock and um, cat fur are my axioms. Those are my starting points that, and you can't, you can't, re, you can't actually reject that because they're axioms. Again, it skirts the whole issue. Just because you call something a justification doesn't make it true. That's why we roll it back in our analysis to what's your criteria for your justification criteria and how would you justify that? You won't from an autonomous epistemology. 
Um, El Well Emmanuel gives a hundred Mexican pesos. Uh, thank you very much. Have you seen any work of Arnold Mindel and process work? If so, what do you think about it? I haven't. Have you, Lewis? No, no, no. But I will take a look. Thank you. Um, T Torchon asks again for ten dollars. Thank you very much. Atheists view theonomous epistemology as a claim about historical science and whether or not Jesus's claims were true. They view it as a case of special pleading slash begging the question, what say you? So that's why I went back to, they think that you're just plugging something in um, arbitrarily that, or like special pleading or something like that. That's why, again, the first thing you want to show is that when they're making claims about special pleading, why is that a bad thing? Why is what's what's right from wrong? What's evidence? What's proof? What's your proof for that? You need to be able to show because there's, like I said, there's nobody that's ideologically or presuppositionally neutral. They hold two things that make their claims that special pleading is bad or any of this stuff. Um, impossible. So they have no arguments. They have nothing to actually say. Um, that's where our apologetic work needs to come in. So they're always like, yeah, but that doesn't prove the, well, again, what's your notion of proof? So they, they keep wanting to go back to, oh, I've got these, I have this concept of proof and justification, what satisfies that, and I don't need to justify that. So I just keep bringing home to that. But there is a story that can do everything that they can. So again, goes back to that disjunctive, right? Everything about what's been preserved in the church, about who God is, how it relates, the lives of the saints, um, how it's transformed people, and the entire corpus of our living theology gives an account and satisfies everything that you want. It has explanatory power. It describes the appearances. It gets out of the problem of a, a autonomous epistemology, and it provides the criteria for, the, for one's justification criteria in a coherent way such that there is no other argument against that. You either accept it or you don't. But you can't then go right around, turn around and go, yeah, but I'm going to have all this justified epistemology and concept of proof and evidence and what's right or wrong or acceptable or not acceptable to push back onto you. So you just got to keep showing them they're not in a position to say that. You either accept it or you don't. So in one sense, we're removing, we're removing the roadblocks. We're not giving them anything to stand on to make a critique so that all men are left with that excuse that there it is. There's nothing, the argument that's going to force you and determine you to accept that. You need to have, accept that by your own heart and free will. But I can make that easier for you by taking away any pretended autonomy. You can't stand on that. There's nothing that exists to stand on. That's our apologetics. Wonderful. Well done. Well, that's it. Well, that's 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 our two hours, and uh, I think we hit it bang on the dot. And um, just a reminder that yes, this all this everything that has been spoken about will be applied to conversation uh, and discussion with Islam at the end of the month. Um, and otherwise, thank you so much, Father Deacon. Uh, thank you, uh, Lewis. Yeah, uh, God bless your work, yeah. and God bless all of you. Uh, Blessed liturgy to all of you who are going to service tomorrow and uh, pray for me, the sinner. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much.